Hello everyone and welcome back to our study on realism. Today is the final video for realism. So we're going to wrap up how much land does a man need and I'm going to explain the essay that you'll have to write based on your understanding of the text theme that will be due at the end of next week. So just a quick recap, just because it has been a little while, okay? In part three, we talked about these conclusions we made about Pockham. And one of the conclusions we make over and over again is the fact that his greed blinds him to the clear warning signs that he should be seeing, right? His dream being the biggest of all these warning signs, and he simply just shrugs it off. But also we have this idea that his greed also drives him to distrust others. So he is driven to blindly believe what he wants, but also driven to distrust even the kindness of others, right? We had the Bashkirs willing to give him all this land that he wanted, and he's very suspicious from the get-go. And finally, we also see how he treats those beneath him with disrespect. And this is significantly important in terms of how he treats his own servant, right? Who's referred to in the text as his man. And we, we think that this is really just awful behavior from Pockham's side because he comes from a lower class existence, just like his, his servant does, right? He came from this peasant background, but now because he has wealth and prosperity and he almost has his hands on even more wealth and more prosperity, he thinks that he can treat those below him in a way as if they're less than himself. And we also talked about, in terms of our literary focus, first this idea of folktale elements, primarily beginning with the deal, right, that has to exist in certain folktales, right? And the deal here that we see is that Pockham can have as much land from the Bashkirs as he wants, so long as he is able to cross as much as he can, right, in a day. And one quick thing I want to pick up on, because it's going to be important in terms of your final reading that you've already completed from the text, he just has to pay a thousand rubles per day, right? It never says anywhere in the text that he only has one day and one day only, right? This is sort of a constraint that Pockham puts on himself, right? Because he doesn't want to pay more than a thousand rubles. We also talked about this uh, issue with foreshadowing. And how we see from the very beginning, right, we as the audience, dramatic irony, know that Pockham has made a deal with the devil, unbeknownst to Pockham himself. And that there are hints throughout the story that things sort of piece themselves together almost if by magic, right? And how this should have been warning us the entire time, and Pockham as well, that the devil is the one who's pulling all of these things together. So again, for today's video, we're going to discuss the very final sections of how much land does a man need, so sections 8 and 9. So do make sure that you've completed that reading before you continue. Let's go ahead then and look at our analysis for section 8. And the first thing that we're going to look at, again, as always, is comprehension. So do I understand the basic premise of what was going on? And in terms of the setting, we are still in Russia, and now we're specifically in the land of the Bashkirs. And the two central characters that we're going to focus on, even though there are more that appear in the background, are Pakam and the chief. So in this portion of the text, we see that Pakam begins his challenge to walk across as much land as he can, right? And although he begins sort of well with a good head on his shoulders, he starts to have this greed creep in, right? He wants to go further and try to do more than perhaps is physically possible. And we also see in the very beginning that the chief sort of sets him up for this idea of greed, of wanting more than he can possibly have. When he, he makes this statement, right? As far as your eye can reach, right? Meaning, look ahead of you. All that you see could potentially be yours. You just have to walk across it, right? So in a sense, playing into Pockham's sense of greed and getting him to think that really he can have everything he desires. Moving then into analysis, the first thing that you should have picked up on in the text is the use of simile, right? It's one of the easiest literary devices to pick up. And, and we see that in the use of simile to describe the fertility of the land, right? It's good soil to plant in. It says, 
as flat as the palm of your hand. So meaning that the land is smooth, it's not rocky or mountainous, meaning it's, it's good for crops. Additionally, right, it's as black as a seed of a poppy, right? So thinking in terms of those of you who might be familiar with farming or with planting, the darker the soil, the richer the soil is, the more nutrients that it has. So this is also going to serve as a way to entice Popham, right? This land is awesome, better than any land he's had before in terms of its, its use for farming, right? And so Popham's going to think that he can't really go wrong with as much land as, as he can claim, but this isn't going to get him to think, maybe I should play it safe. It's going to get him to think that I need to get as much as I possibly can. We're also going to see foreshadowing in this section in particular, and the way that we can pick up on foreshadowing here is to remember the dream that Pakam has, because we need to see, is this dream really a dream, or is it more of a premonition, right, a foreshadowing, of what's going to happen in reality. And the first thing that we begin to see is that Popham begins to take off his outer coat that he was wearing. And you'll recall, right, before we get to this next point, that he's going to eventually, in his dream, see a man lying prostrate on the ground with nothing on, right, but his shirt and his trousers. So we already begin to see that coming to, to fruition here. But he also makes this statement, I might go too far, and as it is, I have a great deal of land. And so this is going to make us think, right, that Paca might begin to sort of see reason, right? But remember, the central theme that we're looking at in this story is definitely going to revolve around being content. And up until now, part of Pockham's characterization is that he is never content with what he has. So although we, we see him make this statement, right, he is not going to stop. He's going to continue to reach for more because that's a big part of who he is, one of his character flaws. The last things we're going to look at then in section eight are our conclusions about Pockham that we're continuing to make. And so again, we see that his greed is first and foremost, and we see it in the way that he is characterized, right? Meaning how the narrator describes him. So when he starts to look at all of the land in front of him, Pockham's eyes glistened, right? So you can imagine, right? Say you've been running outside, it's really hot, especially now. Right, and you see just a nice cool glass of water, right? you're dehydrated, you're thirsty, your eyes are going to glisten. So that, that sense of need, right? In our example, it is a need. You're dehydrated, you need to drink. But in Pockham's example, it's not need, it's want, right? Remember in our previous discussions about the difference between a need and a want, Pockham's greed, his desire for land isn't because he needs it, it's because he wants it. Right? And we also see that everywhere he goes, he's tempted by this land because the further one goes, the better the land seems, right? The land is all the same. We've already been told that as far as the eye can see, it's flat, it's smooth, it's good for planting. So Popham can't possibly go wrong, but he just can't get in control of his greed and his desire for more. And this greed, we also should note, is going to make him irrational at times. And he's going to make this statement, for example, an hour to suffer, a lifetime to live. So he's essentially saying, let me suffer in this heat. Let me exert my body, perhaps beyond what it can handle, because I'll reap the benefits, right, for a lifetime. And we think about that, and perhaps it might make sense. Right? In the sense that oftentimes we have to, to give up things we want now to get things that we want later. But Pockham's placed himself in a situation where he doesn't need to suffer at all. Right? He could have taken a leisure, leisurely stroll, right? and he would still have walked over more land than he could have possibly needed right? in terms of how much he's paying. But he still seeks to, to push himself to the limit because he constantly wants more. We also see, right, that the people on the hillock could scarcely be seen. And you'll see that the narrator constantly reminds us of where they are and how easy or difficult it is for Pockham to see them, right, to give us sort of a visual of how far Pockham's actually walked. 
So by this point in the story, right, the day is halfway gone and he has gotten so far from them that they kind of look like these ants on the top of the hill. So Pockham has gotten himself into a bit of a pickle because we're going to see that he's walked very incredibly far, right, and that he needs to somehow make it all the way back in time. Then we come to section 9, the last section in the text. And comprehension-wise, we're still in the same setting. And now the characters that we're going to talk about are Pockham, the chief, and Pockham's servant. And in terms of Pockham, we see that in this section, he physically exhausts himself to get what he wants. And unfortunately, right, in, in irony being a key player here, that Pockham understands far too late, right, that he has been tricked, that the dream that he had was a warning, and he's going to pay for this mistake with his life, right, in essence, paying for his greed with his existence. But we also see the chief here, and something that we need to question now, right, is was the chief like the mysterious tradesmen, like the peasants in the beginning of the story, the devil in disguise. And we're going to see that the use of constant laughter as foreshadowing, particularly in terms of now when we come to the chief, right, in this text, is going to reveal to us that it's highly possible and a very good way to interpret and analyze this, that these things, these instances of laughter in sections almost seven, so starting with the dream, through section nine, are pointing to the chief as the devil in disguise, as the person who's been constantly trying to, to trick Pockham into basically giving into his greed. And then finally, we're going to talk about Pockham's servant, and he is the one who Pockham has really paid the least amount of attention to, who he hasn't treated with respect. And he is going to be the one at the very end of the story to actually bury Pockham on this land that he's managed to gain. Looking then at our analysis, we continue to see the use of simile. So we see that his heart was beating like a hammer. So this is going to show us how intensely Pockham was running. We also see, right, that his, his breast, meaning his chest, was working like a blacksmith's bellows, right? So a blacksmith means someone who would work with irons. You have a lot of fire and it's very, very intense in terms of its heat and it's a very hard job to do. And all of this being used to show how difficult it is for his body in this heat. And even though he's afraid that this strain he's putting on his heart is going to kill him, Pockham still refuses to stop, right? That's how much he's given in to his greed. Jumping back to foreshadowing, again, we need to remember the dream. That's a huge clue that the narrator gives us in terms of what we need to look for. And at this point in the story, right, right before he falls flat on his face and dies, at this point, he's dressed just like the man in the dream. And remember, when he looks at that man in his dream, he realizes it's himself. And also, we see that the chief is on the ground holding his sides, right? When he sees Pockham coming and collapsing in the ground, right? And again, this mimics what happens with the chief in the dream, who reveals himself to be the devil, right? So this use of laughter to point to the true identity of the chief. And unfortunately, right, Pockham realizes far, far too late, right, that his dream was warning him of this the entire time, and in essence, warning him of the dangers of his greed. And by not listening to these warnings, by giving in to his greed, rather than being content with his life, we see that Pockham, right, rather than getting to live in the midst of all this wealth, ends up dying uh, far from his family and far from getting to, to utilize the land that he's just won. So finally, in terms of our analysis, we're going to look at irony before we dive into the theme of the story. And the very last line of the story I wanted to talk about because we need to remember the title. And in titles in any story, and in particular short stories, right, they hold this key to unlocking the theme and the essence of the story, or a good title does, right? That's why I always harp on you guys for making good titles in your essays, right? Because it 
unlocks the key to what you're discussing. So here, remember the title is How Much Land Does a Man Need? And the very end of the story answers that question for us, right? Six feet from his head to his heels was all he needed. And this would have been the typical height for a grown man, right? So essentially saying, in the end, right, when we're gone, the only land that we need, right, is enough land to bury us in. And although this could be sort of a depressing thought to think about, right, it holds this deeper meaning in, one, highlighting the fact that Pockham realizes too late in life what is actually important. Remember, he spends all of this time trying to chase after land and chasing after more. He neglects his family. He abuses his family. He's never content. He constantly moves. And in the end, it's all for nothing because he doesn't get to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. And this is what's going to lead us to our theme. And remember, we, we think about the theme in terms of what is this greater moral message that the author is trying to teach me? And it really helps that we have background knowledge on Tolstoy himself, because we know right after his sort of spiritual awakening that he makes this question of himself, right? He questions, what's the good of life if I have all of this wealth, if I'm part of the upper class, if I have all of this land, I can't take any of it with me. So what's the point? And this is essentially the question that he's forcing us as the audience and that he tried to force Pockham, right, to answer, what is the significance in life for you? And for Pockham, the significance in life was trying to get more and more and more. And we realized, right, just as Tolstoy wants us to, that this constantly seeking after more doesn't provide contentment for Pockham, right? So in a sense, Tolstoy, through this story, is trying to, to also get us to, to realize that it's not about material goods, right? That's not where we're going to find our contentment in life, but in the deeper things, the deeper meanings in life. That is where we find contentment, sort of looking through those things and what's truly important. And another thing we can pick up on, right, in terms of theme, looking specifically at the story, is that this constant focus on greed leads to loss rather than gain, right? From day one of the story, right, the moment that Pockham says, we would be content if. This is where he opens himself up to temptation. And we see that this temptation to constantly seek after more, right, rather than leading to more, like Pockham thinks it does, it's going to lead him ultimately to the loss of his own life. So in thinking about pinpointing a potential theme, one of the many themes you could talk about, one of the many wordings, for example, of this theme in terms of contentment, might be that chasing after more, rather than being content with what you have, only leads to loss and pain, a lesson that Pockham unfortunately learns far too late. That is it for our discussion of how much land does a man need and our discussion on realism. So to conclude this portion of our studies in this unit, rather, I would like to assign you guys an essay. And this should be a very easy essay to write in terms of accessing the text, right? Particularly because this is a realist text and the language is not difficult and the theme is very, very obvious, right? So your prompt is going to be this. How does Leo Tolstoy portray the theme of how much land does a man need through the use of irony, foreshadowing, and characterization, right? So for this, I will allow you, if you just want to discuss two of these three, so meaning you have two body paragraphs rather than three, that's fine by me. If you'd like to discuss something outside of these in relation to theme, that is also fine. Just send me an email with your ideas so that I can let you know if you are on the right track or not. So this essay will be due on Friday, May 29th. So I'm giving you guys um, sort of a break in terms of consideration uh, of having the holiday over the weekend, right? So factoring that in, please have these turned into me by email or by Google Classroom, okay? Whichever one is, is working for you. By Friday, May 29th at midnight. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in our next video when I introduce our next and final unit for the year.